Welcome back, everyone, for day three of Structure Event 2. Yeah. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a big thanks to Snow Peak, to Chelsea and Nate for the reception that they hosted last night. That was awesome. Hope everyone had a chance to get over there and continue the great conversations that we started yesterday and the day before. Um, we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. And uh, out of curiosity, uh, could we just get a quick show of hands for everyone who was here last year? Nice, nice, great. Okay, thank you. So uh, now I'm just going to turn it over to Michelle to introduce our first speaker of the day. I'm not going to stand on the stage. I'm tall enough, right? You can all see me, right? All right, I just wanted to say good morning. I don't want to cut into too much time, but I wanted to give a little introduction to uh, the first two speakers because I was really excited to have them here, have them back. Um, but one of the things I wanted to touch on, yesterday I really picked up on a word that I wanted to highlight for today. And what I was hearing, especially early on in the day, was the importance of culture. So a design culture, and I was thinking about that, talked about it at the party last night, and saying like, what we need to do is really build design culture into our, our businesses and our brands, and there's a lot of new brands that are just, they're building that up, they're starting it that way. Um, and there's a lot of existing brands that didn't start that way and are trying to build it, or we want them to build it, or whatnot. But thinking about the importance of culture and what cultures are being created by the outdoor industry now. The new brands are really doing so much about you know, energy and storytelling and building a culture, something that feels real. But it's really hard, it's intangible. And so I want to really talk about two things about on another cultural side that were very important for me in design, whereas you know, being influenced by other cultures. I'm very, very influenced by Scandinavian design, by Japanese design, and I think a lot of people here are. We already know that it's a very beautiful, simplistic, simple, considered, like really great design. As William Lidwell said last, last year, he talked about the Maya principle, you know, the most advanced yet acceptable, um, and talked about how design gets simpler and simpler as we get more sophisticated. And I feel like the, the Scandinavian and Swedish cultures and Japan have done always been amazing at that, and we're really recognizing that. So I've had these experiences to really be able to learn about Japanese culture early on in my life. My father used to raise bonsai trees. He had like 80 little bonsai trees that I had to water as my chore as a kid. And I watched him trim the branches and whatnot. And then being able to run the Japanese line at, uh, at Columbia Sportswear and really learn about that about probably 15 years ago now, and really learn about how they were different, how they embraced the outdoor industry unapologetically, and their stuff was just so so cool, and they did it in just such a cool way. Um, and then also really being able to be influenced by Scandinavian design in school. I think uh, you know, and we had a great program at an old defunct college called Basist College. I think Tasha, I don't know if you're still here today. But uh, we went to school together there. And we had a great program about, that showed you know, architecture, music, and clothing and apparel. We had several classes of this where you could just see it through the years. And I really was inspired by Biedermeyer. Uh, and that sparked my early interest in Biedermeyer, Biedermeyer uh, furniture, beautiful woods, the simple designs at a time when everything was really ornate. So, um, and then I had the, the wonderful chance to also travel to, uh, with Columbia Sportswear, with Stockholm, Copenhagen, Antwerp. I got to choose those places and go and get very inspired there. And then at the North Face, I got to work with a Swedish designer who hired me there, a design director named Frederick Dahl. He came from uh, leading design at Peak Performance, he worked at Hagloffs. And uh, later on, went on to start the Jane Lindenberg ski line that we were seeing at ISPO a few years ago. He really opened my eyes up to wonderful Swedish design and also how it connected to Japanese design. I got to travel with him in Tokyo, across the Alps, and whatnot, and really understand his way of thinking. And so it really, uh, really put an impression on me. 
I invited him to come here this year to speak. He was planning on coming to talk about the importance of having a design language, you know, simplistic design, but you have to have a design language and really show it in a very in a few details. Very, very difficult. Uh, he wasn't able to make it, but we did get an interview with him from Emily Walser. We'll see that in the next uh, post-show Trend Insight, and hopefully he'll make it next year. So this year we, uh, we have brought back Andrea Westerlin, and to me, uh, and then we also brought in Nate Moore from Snow Peak. So we have, Andrea comes from that Scandinavian culture, that Swedish culture. They were not, uh, she and Nate from Snow Peak, the Japanese brand, they're not here to really talk about the culture. They're gonna talk about other things, but in what those brands do and what they embody, they are that, they bring that culture. They just bring it with them, it's innate, it's in what they do, and I'm really excited to have First Andrea come on and then Nate come on to talk about these, you know, these wonderful, beautiful brands and what they do that represent these cultures. So welcome and I'll hand it over. Hey, good morning. Sweden first. This is a Swedish princess wearing it. She's like, 
influential person to wear a brand in Sweden. Um, also, Italian, French, Montclair, and I was from Australia, and I started studying these cases, and I thought I was going to do the same, and why not do it with one of Sweden's most iconic brands, Fjallraven. So I was still like in my early 20s, and I was really naive and, and but enthusiastic, and I approached them, and somehow uh, I convinced them to give me the distribution rights for North America. Um, and, and this was like all done through a handshake deal. Uh, and anything I can tell anyone who wants to invest their career and all the money in building somebody else's brand on a foreign market is like trying to get something on paper. Because <laughs> it, it can become really handy down the road when you build one of the two biggest global markets. Um, so, anyways, I didn't have a lot of money. And, um, so I had to, to build one product at a time because building inventory is really expensive and I uh, chose this iconic school backpack um, and I put it in all the, the cool stores that I already had relationships with like Barney's and J. Crew became our biggest customer and uh, opening ceremony and Stephen Allen and so on. And what they did was because their customers, a lot of them are young and creative and cool, they build the brand by just wearing it around. So after uh, a couple of years of selling to them, I'd really build the brand uh, on the urban market. Um, and that was great. Like finally things were working out. There was money coming in. I had this like kind of steady cash um, <coughs> position. And I thought now it's time to take it to the outdoor market. Uh, I'm gonna go to OR. And I got like a big bank hall and I flew out with my team and we built this beautiful Scandinavian clean looking booth uh, and we spent the next four days taking not a single order. Like, the brand just was not resonating with the outdoor market. Um, and it was kind of the first time. Which year was that? That was probably year 2000 and 2009. Yeah. Um, and I went there three times, uh, and I had the same reaction there. Uh, and I spent a whole year taking the collection on the road and seeing like all the independent retailers, and uh, same story there. Like when I went to REI, they pretty much declared me insane. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a humbling experience. Um, and the only customer I was actually able to pick up was, was this one, Neptune's one near you older. And Gary Neptune, uh, the uh, owner, uh, and I, we became really good friends and we got to bond over some of the, the ideas that we shared. Like we both liked durability versus lightweight and we liked classic design and we liked like all these old school brands. Um, and we, we both took a lot of inspiration from, from the military stuff. Like Gary has this huge engineering uh, museum in his store. Uh, that's really cool. I called him earlier this week and said, I'm, I'm going to include you in my presentation as one of my mentors. Can you send me a picture? Uh, and he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he also has good humor. <laughs> um, but he invited me to his house and, and I stayed with him and his wife, Bibi, and uh, we were rock climbing together and skiing. And uh, he kind of explained to me how the outdoor industry had shifted from being run by like this creative group of outdoor misfit enthusiasts to, to be run by this very corporate kind of price-driven uh, industry. Um, and how hard it was to be uh, an independent multi-brand store. And, and like that's what I was banking on to build my brand, these cool independent stores with a point of view, because that's what I've done in the fashion industry. Um, so I kind of, it started to dawn on me that it just was not going to happen for me this way. If I was going to continue working in the outdoor industry, I, I would have to create like my whole uh, own channel. Um, so then I parted ways with Fail Raven a year after. Um, it kind of gave me a, an opportunity to start fresh. Um, and the first thing I did was, um, because I still loved like, the outdoor industry, I really wanted to work in it. And, I love going to outdoor retailer. I love the vibe and I love the people and a lot of the product, but I knew like it was never going to be a place for me to introduce new brands. Um, 
So I went to the best fashion trade show that I knew, and uh, I convinced them to start an outdoor section with me, and I called it Above Tree Line. Or actually, Jeff Broke was here today and called it Above Tree Line. Uh, that's where the name comes from. Um, but what I liked about Capsule uh, is uh, that every brand has the same rules. Like, no matter how much money you have or how established you are, uh, you have exactly the same setup as uh, the newcomers. And it really gives this fo a focus on product. Like, I like to call it the communist version of the war. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first season we did with, uh, which was in like this sh shitty, shitty industrial building with low ceiling, and terrible lighting. Uh, and we just spread out uh, this cedar shavings. Like from a hamster cage, <laughs> or a pet store, and had the tree stumps and the bar, and it, it was one of the first shows that a lot of these new outdoor brands did, like Tobo Designs and Polar, and uh, Unova Ridge was there, and Outlier, and uh, Snowy. Also, not a new brand, but they were there. Um, and the other thing I thought was, it's really uh, kind of boring to go to trade shows because I was doing like 10 of them a year or more. Um, I wanted to make it, it more, uh, just make it more fun. And Gary had often talked about how like in the early days of the outdoor industry, when he was young, he was always hanging out with his competitors. Like all the people that had brands, they were also timing together. Uh, so I thought, why don't we go camping together during the trade show? Uh, and this is during the Vegas show we camp out in Red Rocks. Um, and we had to sit around the campfire and shoot the shit <laughs> guns <laughs> and pictures and whiskey. Um, and it's such a fun place to be in the middle of these young brands and share our ideas and really grow this trend into uh, something bigger and make it last longer. Um, the next thing I did was to rebuild my showroom and I knew having just one brand was very risky. So um, I decided to build a multi-brand showroom. And I looked for brands that were category type brands that could work together and not compete. Um, and so I started traveling around the world and I found uh, the following. Uh, this is Willpower from Sweden. They're still produced in Sweden. They haven't changed any of their uh, styles since the 1970s, which I think allows them to do this. And every sewer sews in his or her name into the garment. We show this to a customer, an urban customer, uh, in our stores in New York, it's like the best story um, there is. Uh, we also have Giro Cycling Apparel, we have Shadowworks, Backpacks, Made in Montana, uh, Snow Peak, Gear and Apparel, we help them in the fashion market, um, Ronin's Raincoats from Sweden, uh, Barney, classic eyewear brand from France that we're helping we launch in the States right now. Armalex, who produces for the French Navy in Brittany, and we make some of our own uh, products. And this isn't really a focus of ours, it's just when we feel like we can't really find somebody else to do this for us, we, we make it. Like, I feel like it's my job to find the great designers and products out there, it's not really to compete with them. Um, but anyways, this this. Merchandise really worked together as a great showroom experience, but it also worked really good as a retail experience. Um, so in 2011, we opened up the first Farmalex store. Um, and it was really easy for us because we already had the product, but we also had really good margins because we were the distributors. Uh, we almost had the same margins that uh, you would have if you would go through the trouble of producing, developing, and designing this. Except I didn't have to deal with designers. Growing up with them, I knew it would have been in the ass office. <laughs> right? <laughs> Kidding. Um, and I tried to tell a lot of young brands this, try to get your own retail store, like try to get your own channel where you can make the double margin and when you have that steady cash flow, you really need that to grow your business. Um, and you also learn a lot from having that, like we see our retail stores very much as our sales lab. Because uh, when you talk to the consumer, it's a little bit of a different experience than talking to buyers. Like, you really get to learn what works and what doesn't work. And every time you bring a new brand in from another country, there's always something that's different. Like, no man in America wants to wear a gold neck sweater. Like, they just won't do it. 
And we got to learn that really quickly through our own retail store, and we could change it, uh, and we could react and, and make it successful. Um, this is our website, we launched it in 2011, and it's a collection of all the brands we work with, and where we also get to test a lot of new brands. Um, this is the Westland store in Soho uh, that opened last year. Uh, again, and this is our ski shop that we opened in January on top of Summit Powder Mountain. And the ski shop is really uh, fun for me because I feel like it's something I was kind of born to do. Um, and growing up in the Alps and going to all these like heritage uh, ski shops, uh, I saw how they mix like local products with foreign products. Like they would have the Swiss felted jackets with horn buttons and like felted hats with feathers uh, and mix it with like Bordner and Montclair. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to recreate and I invited my friend <coughs> Kat Gay uh, to do this project with me. And Kat's a really talented stylist and vintage sourcing person and we spent <coughs> weeks scouring every Salvation Army you know, and Desert Industries in Arden Valley and came up with this half vintage, half new <coughs> ski shop that really worked well together. And that's a huge part of my uh, retail concept is to have that strong local element and create the culture um, that I think also Gary had. And he was another great inspiration for this. Or maybe the success was that we had a shot ski. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very, very well used shot ski. Um, but the other thing that uh, it did was it created uh, an opportunity for us to start producing our own content because we had this beautiful scenery right outside our shop door. It's really easy for us to just shut the door and run out and take a few pictures if the lighting was right or it started snowing or uh, you know if we had time over we could. Um, start working on developing this talent and we you know we weren't really good at it at first but we grew pretty good at it and we started just spitting out images and outfits and we had so much fun like styling it together and uh, kind of trying to be creative in the way we use the garments like try to show people how you can use um, a Giro cycling jacket also for climbing or hiking or city and you can also make natural fibers with uh, man-made fibers and I've never been really good at expressing my mission in words so this was a really good opportunity for me to show what I meant in, in images and I could spread them on the internet and reach so many more people uh, doing this. Um, and the other great thing about being a small company is you can really like if you get to a place where you have these talents and you don't have to be like perfect at it, you just have to kind of know the basics of doing it, you can use all these opportunities that come your way. Like if a good photographer would walk in our door, um, we would go shoot some pictures with them, or a famous athlete or like a big blogger, like there were so many good things that happened just because we were flexible and we were there ourselves and we could make this happen. Um, this is during the camp out of Vegas. Uh, we also shoot some pictures. We go climbing in the morning. Um, <coughs> and I kind of think that ever since I stopped trying to be this like business person, or I was trying to fit into uh, an industry that was really interested in my thing, and I had to really try to figure out my own uh, little niche that. Uh, I really started If you're willing to do some of the shitty stuff, like paint floors and pack boxes, you also get to do a lot of the fun stuff, like you get to travel around the world and uh, find new brands and you get to take bloggers, lobster fishing in Maine, uh, and uh, you get to do uh, to really live the lifestyle, like you don't get to do a lot of the times when uh, you're in a bigger company. Uh, you just kind of have to put yourself out there and do some things that are a little uncomfortable at first. Sort of like I'm doing standing here speaking with you today. <laughs> uh, that's it. Thank you so much.